Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Okay, this is it, the last podcast for 2022. And I've got to ask, where did the time go? It really has been a memorable year on so many levels. On the positive side, we saw tremendous milestones like the rollout of the B-21. We also dealt with a lot of challenges around the globe in places like Ukraine and watching tensions near the boiling point in the Pacific with actions precipitated by China. Air and space power have been a key part of all of this, and we're really, really enjoying sharing our perspectives and insights with you. Now, if you joined us last week, you know that we're swapping flying stories over the holiday break, and we normally talk about pretty serious topics, but it's fun to take a break and think about what it was like to strap into the jet and push it up. As you know, most members of our Mitchell team began their careers in the Air Force in the cockpit, which really differentiates the Mitchell Institute from a lot of other counterparts that we have here at DC. So sit back, relax, and have some fun as we think about our time back on the flight line. Okay, so with all of that, I am really excited to welcome back General Chilton to the Aerospace Advantage. Sir, welcome back. Hey, great to be with you, Slick. We also have a returning Major General Larry Stutz, Stutzream. Stutz, welcome back. Hey, Slick. Thanks a lot. And of course, our very own Heather Penny. Lucky, thanks for joining us and telling some stories. Awesome. Great to be back. Happy holidays. You as well. And last but not least on the intros, we've got Chris Jekyll Bruner with us. And Jekyll, great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be talking to you again, Slick. Yeah, and I think I actually get a get a chance to tell a story as well, so I'll look forward to doing that at the end. But, you know, I'm really, really excited and, you know, can't forget that, of course, rank has its privileges. So, sir, I want to get started with you. And, of course, everyone wants to hear from the astronauts. So, General Chilton, you know, we've covered your background earlier this year, but we'll refresh our audience. You started out in the RF-4 and then transitioned to the F-15, then got checked out in a slightly well-known aircraft called the Space Shuttle, which is pretty epic. And then you also had some time in the B-15. The U2 and a bunch more. So I think everybody sitting around this table, and of course the listeners, are really envious of your flying background and experience, and just love to hear anything that you'd like to share with us today. Well, sure. Hey, thanks, Slick. I think I maybe wore out my shuttle stories last fall, so I I, I was thinking back to a a flight I had. It was a test flight when I was a test pilot, and I'll entitle this story "Flying Formation with an Aim 7. So we had this test we were doing with a, an AIM-7 off an F-15 shooting at a high-fast flyer. And the high-fast flyer was happened to be the last F-106 in the drone inventory of the United States Air Force. And being the last airplane, it was really hard to get this thing airborne. And all the maintainers and everybody in charge of the drone program were really excited to see this airplane go away. Oh, that's awful, though. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but still. Yeah, I, I, for nostalgic reasons, I, I wasn't in such a hurry, but of course, I'm shooting at it, so I would like to see it go away as well. But this particular shot was to be a supersonic shot off the F-15, and the 106 was, I forget what altitude it was at, but it's about as high as fast as it could go, obviously unmanned. And I had a, a photo chase with me in another, a two-seat F-15 with a, a photographer in a back seat. And we were in a racetrack pattern waiting for the target to come up and he got airborne and we, we timed everything just to hit our test point, right? We had a certain range we were supposed to shoot at, et cetera. Anyway, we're coming around the uh, racetrack for the final run-in to lock this guy up and shoot him. And since it's a supersonic shot, we're, we're already supersonic coming around the corner probably somewhere around Mach 1.5. Well, the, the chase airplane had an augmentation problem in pitch in the turn and kind of got into a minor pitch PIO and immediately yanked the throttles to idle, but didn't want to call knock it off because, you know, everything was lined up looking good. So unbeknownst to me, he 
because I wasn't paying attention to him, wasn't supposed to be. He dropped way back in trail. So I roll out and I and I lock up the 106 and he's conning. And so it's kind of easy. I can see him visually. I'm just waiting for the appropriate range to shoot the missile. So I'm, I'm head down in the cockpit looking at the radar and we get to the point and I pickle off the AIM-7, which I've, I've shot AIM-7s before. You know, it sounds like a giant clunk. And, and then I, I immediately look up to see this thing go out in front of me and start climbing toward the target. And when I look up, I see a, a cloud of smoke in front of me. And I, I go through that relatively quickly. And then I, I look up to see the missile going up toward the, the 106, and I don't see anything. And about that time, I hear my chase, who I can't see, yelling in the radio, terminate, 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 which was the call to blow the missile up. And I look out <laughs> my, my left wing, and I'm flying formation with this AIM-7, which had come off the forward right station and barrel rolled over the front of my cockpit at, at supersonic, <laughs> and then was sitting there okay. kind of rest with me. Now, he's probably about you know, three or 400 feet off my left wing. And I go, this, is, this doesn't look right. And I'm hearing him call terminate. So I, I immediately kind of ease into a right-hand bank. Yeah, I was going to say, wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait a second before you hit the terminate button. <laughs> Get away from this thing. Wait. And sure enough, they terminated the missile. I, I didn't see him terminate because I was trying to get away from it at that point. The F-106 lives another day. <laughs> and they were so upset. <laughs> the one was and to give you an idea how upset they were with that, a few months later, I was fragged for another test top against this airplane with this AIM-7. And a different scenario was a look down, shoot down. And uh, they said, we're not even putting a telemetry package on this. We're putting a live warhead on it. And, and so I actually got to shoot down the F-106 with a live warhead on the next stop, and everybody was happy, including me. Was it cool? Did you, did you get to see the uh, did you get to see the splash? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a there's a look down over the White Sands missile range, and I saw the airplane explode and I saw the missile go off, then the airplane come apart. And I was always tempted to go back out in a Jeep sometime or because I know exactly where it hits. I could find the spot today. It was a unique formation there. And I'm hearing up. a field trip for Mitchell. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Go out and pick, up a, pick up a little piece of the cockpit that I'm sure is still laying out there in the dry desert of the White Sands. Oh, that's incredible. Well, Stets, let's face it. The Phantom is just one of the coolest jets ever. And you have time in the F-16 and the A-10 as well. And you came into the service at a really interesting point as the Air Force was pulling it together after Vietnam and forming into a really potent air arm and, and probably the best the world's ever seen. So do you have a story you want to share with us? Yeah, I do. Let's go back to 1988, height of the Cold War. And I was just transitioning to the, the F-16. It was the early block F-16, block 10s. And they're so sweet and simple, but they're very limited at that time to what they have today. You know, it was fantastic. But looking back, it was kind of like a Chippendales dancer. Performed well, looked great, but it wasn't very sophisticated, not very smart. That's um, how would you know what a Chippendale dancer <laughs> looks like? I got to jump in. I had a career before the Air Force <laughs> General. <laughs> So anyway, I was just, you know, I just transitioned. I had a handful of hours, did the short course in the F-16, a handful of hours. I'm down at Homestead, Florida, and just super inexperienced. But there, we were transitioning in the Fighting Wild Ducks, the 309 to the F-16. And there was a dearth of experience. And I was a young major. I found myself as chief of Stan of Al, you know, a guy with like 10 hours in the F-16. I'm giving other guys check cards. And one day... The wing commander, Colonel Tiny West, and he was not tiny, by the way. He's a hulk of a man. He calls me to his office, and he wants to prove something new. And remember this time, at this time in history, all fighters were attacking low. You know, it was all about low altitude ingress, go underneath the threat, pop up, roll on your back, turn over, come down, drop your bombs, and go back down to 300 feet and try not to get hit. But our electronic combat capabilities were maturing and so forth. And so West, who was a pretty smart guy tactically, he said, okay, Stutz, I want you to go out and I want you to come up with a plan for a medium altitude, large force. I want a whole squadron of F-16s, attack a target in Alabama. 
he pointed at a map somewhere in Alabama, some range there. And he said, uh, and I want it to be all calm out. We're going to show these guys this is the way of the future. Medium altitude, large force employment. We're going to make history. And so I went and I was out of body because I was looking at myself as not the guy for this, this task with so little experience in the F-16. And so a couple of weeks later, there I am at the end of the runway. I've got this armada, you know, the righteousness of God behind me, 23 other F-16s, three air spares included, and it's all calm out. We take off, do this big loop around Homestead so we can get together, and we're going to go by elements of twos, about two miles apart. And we start flying up, and sure enough, the Florida weather, southeast weather, we get into the soup, and I'm leading this thing. Everybody's locked up with their radars to me, so I can't hear a thing. I'm turning down volumes and trying to focus and not having flown in the weather in, in the F-16 at that time yet. I had every symptom of spatial disorientation and I had the leans. I had the big heavy hand. I had, and then, you know, when you're in that situation and you're hitting Q, cumulus, that's in the, in the stratus, big, big, huge deck. Oh yeah. It's like, it, it's like a waterbed. It's like you're, you're oh flying God. a waterbed. And it makes like. it, oh, it makes it worse. It's it, and, and but my wingman was tucked in. He was like almost too tight, doing great. But I was upside down, and I have to break break for a second here because it was pretty bad. I started hearing like, I felt like I was thirty degrees nose low, accelerating. I'm on the instruments, knowing I'm not. All of a sudden, like my canopy's making noise I've never heard before. My engines don't sound right. My throttles are too tight. It's all the classic symptoms of a space disorientation. But uh, I was raised by some great war fighters, and one was Jim Ryan. He's passed now, but he was a weapon system officer in the F-4. And that's kind of a tradition we have to pass the knowledge from guys a couple years older than you. And he would just tell me, Things are going to happen to you. You're going to be upside down. Guys are going to blow up in your formation. You just got to keep moving. And whatever you do, stunts, don't ever, don't ever let them see you sweat. And I was soaked in this F-16, in this weather. And I was at the end of my tolerance. And suddenly, bam, we came out of the weather. And it was this dry line, beautiful blue skies, you know, the sun to the east at four o'clock. And my wingman is pointing forward at you know, as I check him out, and there is our tanker constellation exactly where it's supposed to be. 24 F-16s up to about, I think we had four tankers or so, almost as if I was a skilled fighter pilot and had planned this out somehow. <laughs> and so the rest, of the, the rest of the mission was fine. We hit these targets simultaneously. We dropped about 34 tons of ordnance on them, and we come back, not a click of the mic, and we land, we debrief, and all I could hear was Jim Ryan telling me, don't let him see a sweat. So we finished up, guys are high five, and I go back to my office, and this lieutenant comes in, who was like blue 24 back there. He was a real talkative guy. He was, you know, so he sits down, he goes, he goes, Stutz, you were scared, weren't you? And, and I told him, I said, hey, hey. And I told him the whole story Jim Ryan told me. I said, hey, guys are going to blow up in your formation. You're not going to know it. You're going to have all sorts of crazy stuff happen. Don't ever let them see you sweat. And at that point in time, I would completed the circle of life of one fighter pilot handing this wisdom that we learn in very odd and strange ways to the next generation. And I, I want to confess, to this day, I have never actually expressed how buffoonic and scared and sweating I was, but I, I've decided to come clean today. <laughs> Why well, start thanks, now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's too late. We'll edit that part out. I kid, I kid. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's great. That's it. Yeah. You got to pass it forward. Right. Well, Heather, I want to move on to, you know, you and I should be recording, you know, video segments, flying formation and our Stearmans, cause that would be uh, super cool. So I'm throwing down, we have to do that next year. Amen. Um, yes. Let's let, that is more than a new year's resolution. We're going to go fly. Absolutely. So, you know, a little more than our flying days in the Viper, but it's going to be cool. So, but I think everybody knows your background. You spent most of your career in the DC guard flying the F-16 block 30. So what do you have for us? 
Okay, well, I'll tell you the story I really want to tell you about is getting to go fly an air tractor 802 this summer in the backseat, but maybe I'll save that for next year because that was, again, true to my call sign, better lucky than good, wrong place at the right time. But I'll tell you a story about when my first deployment to Iraq in 03. So part of the uh, the 410th, because the DC Guard, we still had a bunch of alert commitments and flying combat air patrols and all of that. We ended up getting sent over, chopped up between the Alabama Guard and the Buckley Guard, and I was in the Buckley Guard. And our job, because we were guard guys with the pre-block F-16s, we had the saddle data link, we had tar- the lightning targeting pod. We could do some pretty cool stuff, free text with the Army. So our job was going to go be scud hunters in the Western desert of Iraq. Now, I had just finished, you know, roughly six to nine months of the midnight to 4 a.m. shift of combat air patrols over D.C., which wasn't super exciting, you know, block 20 to 24, flying circles over the nation's capital with NVGs, but it gave me a ton of NVG time, so I was primarily a night guy in Iraq. So one of the very few day sorties that I got was several weeks into the beginning of combat operations, and we had kind of expanded a little bit of what we were doing mission-wise. I mean, obviously, we were still really focused on the counter-scud operation, but part of what we were doing there was integrating with the special ops troops that were those guys that were spread out all over the desert as well. So we were involved with Haditha Dam. We would do troops in contact for the soft guys when they came in touch with bad guys. So we get called in by a small task, you know, a small team, because they have stumbled upon an Iraqi convoy that is not moving. And they're really concerned that this long line of tanks and other armored vehicles uh, has detected them, and that's why they've stopped. And so they, they really need help sort of scoping out the situation. They're probably going to need some close air support, so they call us in. We go in and we're, you know, up in the up in the teens and we're looking down through our targeting pods and we can see the line and very, yay, verily, there's a line of tanks and a bunch of armored vehicles out there and they're not moving, but we can't really figure out what's going on. So we start to circle down a little bit lower and we're changing black hot, white hot. We're playing with our games. We're going to EO so we can see them in TV and we still can't really figure out like what what's going on here? Why aren't they moving? We're not really seeing people. So we're getting a little bit lower and a little bit lower. And uh, we're talking to the to the soft guys and, and they're anxious too, because we're not giving them any sort of winning comms that the situation is going to going to be good for them. And then I look out the window, I get outside the drool cup and I look out the window and yay, verily, we are on an Iraqi bombing range. You can see you can see the rain circles. You can see the nuke running line. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and the reason why the tanks weren't moving is because they'd been shot to pieces, <laughs> which is another reason why we couldn't get a really good uh, identification of the threat. So it was just we we, we looked outside and we go, oh yeah, all right. Hey Heather, a target's a target. Okay, <laughs> you take what you get. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Oh, that is absolutely awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I love it. Yeah. You know, you always get talked onto some some weird stuff, especially at night. So Jekyll, man, it's awesome to have you here. You know, you served as a weapon system officer primarily in the B one. And I've got to be honest, it's you know, one of the coolest looking jets ever, in my opinion. And the fact that, you know, you've got, you know, basically four F-16 engines underneath you is, is pretty incredible. So an afterburner takeoff or flyby in one of those is just absolutely incredible. Uh, and I think you also have some B-52 time as well. So it takes the team into the bomber to net success. And you're obviously a key part of that. So let's hear one of your stories. Yeah, just real quick. I started out in B-52s at Fairchild. And that's more of a sad story, uh, as everybody knows. So I'm not going to talk about that much at all. But so... Back when I was a captain, I went to weapons school, 98 Alpha, went back to a test squadron at Ellsworth. Great job for me. I like that type of stuff, you know, solving puzzles and and getting to test all the new toys. And and we had just finished testing what was called Block D, and I was integrating 1760 weapons onto the the B-1. So putting GPS on the airplane and letting us drop JDAM and also putting tow decoy and, and a couple of other things on there. And that was right before the whole thing in Kosovo kicked off with Allied Force. 
So we're finishing up the block D. It was pretty obvious that the guys on base were getting ready to deploy. They were going to take the block D jets with them. I just happened to be flying with the squadron commander of that squadron on what's called a lot acceptance test, letting him drop some JDAM, see how all that works. And in that seven hour sortie, I successfully told him why I needed to deploy with them as a test guy, because I knew everything that was going on and could help him out. And, and it ended up happening. It ended up being in the mission planning cell for the first part of that, but then started flying the sorties. And, you know, as a weapons school guy, that's, that's what you want to do is be out there in combat. And this particular sortie, it's, I don't know if it's funny, but it was interesting. Rolling towards the eastern side of Serbia, there's a little airfield called next to that portion of Serbia is another little country called Bulgaria. A couple of nights prior to we came into Nice with our, our two jets carrying 84 Mark 82s to go blow up a POL facility on that airfield, some uh, F-16 guy accidentally lobbed a harm into the capital of Bulgaria, which is Sofia. So Sofia becomes a little bit important a little bit later here. We come in and into the target area. All the weapons come off except for a couple in like the aft base. So we have three hung Mark 82s, which from 84, that's not a bad deal. But uh, we ended up getting shot at coming off that target. And I, all I remember is the co-pilot uh, looking out his window, seeing two really bright dots going really fast and they're coming at us. And, he, and he's kind of just staring at him. And my good friend, Jeff Tolliver, who's the pilot sitting in the left seat of the jet is like, are you going to move the jet or not? And, you know, I, being the guys in the back, you're like, yeah, that'd be a great idea right now. And, you know, I'm putting out as much chaff as I can. What ended up happening is the guy put the airplane in full blower. We're up at 1.37 Mach. You're not supposed to go at 1.2. Fuel flow at that airspeed and is about 342,000 pounds per hour when you have all four engines in, in blowers. So we're going through gas pretty quickly. And mind you, at the time, we, the B-1 was still a little bit older in that we didn't have a moving map or anything like that. The moving map was my chart I had on my little table in front of me trying to keep up with where we're at and a threat reaction, you know, getting away from the two. We think there were SA-3s that were shot at us going, you know, mock snot. So what ends up happening, and we found about this later, and I was in the defensive seat, and I see all these different types of threats that weren't brief start popping up, like a two, a three, and a 10. And all the while, we have missile launch indications behind us, which is another part of the story. So I was like, where are we? And we ended up plotting in the coordinates. And we're in Bulgaria going 1.37 Mach. At their, pointed at their capital. So they, they were getting a little antsy at that, particularly because somebody just shot a harm at them. Going back to the missile launch indications behind us, and the reason why we kept heading towards Bulgaria is because we found out that through a process of elimination that every time we turn off our tow decoy, the missile launch indications would go away. So there was something going on in the decoy. We're doing operational tests on the run here. It actually ended up being a self-test that would put out a signal that would cause our RWR to provide a false indication. But anyway, so we figured Not like that out. Going Mach 1.3, you were a different kind of test pilot. You yeah, were we were, we were balling. Then what we figure out, we're in Bulgaria. So we figured out we better head, you know, do a pretty good right turn to get back into Montenegro and get heading back down to the Adriatic for our air refueling. But since we've been you know, hauling the mail there at that type of fuel flow, we show up in the Adriatic with about 30,000 pounds of gas. And that's not a lot of gas in a B-1, especially on the Adriatic. And this jet had, had a history of not being able to take gas from the tanker and get behind the tanker. And by the way, in Allied Force, I think it was more spooky in the AR tracks in the beginning because everybody's flying around with their lights off and there's jets everywhere. But it was just kind of crazy getting out there, oh, low on fuel, can't take jet gas from the tanker, and we start looking at places to go. We can't go to Albania. We can't make it to Aviano. It's too far. So we end up going into Brindisi, where a bunch of soft guys are, so special ops guys. But Brindisi is only calling an eighth of a mile biz. And we're getting lower and lower on gas. And, you know, technically, I don't think we were. We could fly the approach with that, but we kind of had to, had to do it. But eventually getting into Brindisi, the Italians are all upset with us because nobody likes bombers landing in their country. You know, it wasn't a nuke bomber at that point, but everybody always puts that kind of uh, weight on it. We have had ton weapons, but we didn't tell them about that. We end up sleeping underneath the jet on the ramp until we could get gas. And the Italians are yelling at us, you got to leave by six. And we kept asking them, when can we get gas? And they keep saying seven o'clock. And it's like, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> domani, Domani. Yeah, but it was just kind of an experience. And then the jet ended up breaking once we got gas and we ended up staying there. But it was 
I think we landed with maybe 14,000 pounds of fuel on the airplane. Didn't have a lot of options. Wasn't looking good there with the weather, but in the end, everything worked. And, but it just, you know, it's a great airplane. Unfortunately, we're dropping 84 Mark 82s, which was a little bit of overkill per jet instead of JDAM, but the B2 guys were hogging those up all, all at that time because there just weren't that many. But that, that was probably the most eventful sortie of my career. Wow, you know, Jack, an F-16 guy could have a lot of fun with, what was it, 13,000 pounds of gas? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I will say one thing. I love the I love the B-1, and uh, Jekyll and I were talking about this earlier. In the early uh, year of OEF in Afghanistan, you know, even when the B-1s ran out of ordnance, we'd send them down supersonic, and we could, the Taliban would just break up their, their forces and you know, run away because the B-1 was making all this noise. That was pretty fun, fun to watch. Yeah, and you know, the thing about being on a crewed jet too, and it's, sometimes it's hard to come up for, with good stories because you have three other guys to cover up your buffoonery. <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, it equals out in the end. But uh, yeah, combat experience was awesome. Great group of people. And I was fortunate to fly with guys who weren't just pilots, but guys who employed weapon systems. And I think that's the key. Yeah. Hey, Stutz, a question for you. Did you ever fly sure. a SCAR mission being led into a target by an RF-4 when you're flying Phantoms in training? I, I did. I did a couple of those on a, it actually was in the Texas training mission, not, not in any operational setting. Yeah. Well, I don't think it was ever done operationally because it was a suicide mission as best I could tell. <laughs> but but I, probably the guys you flew with out of Bergstrom were shooting yes. Willie Peets. They were shooting Willie Peets to mark. Yes. The, so uh -huh. for the audience, the concept was, you know, most, most fighter pilots, strikers, they know the target they're going after generally back in those days. And they planned it out their low level ingress. As you said, that was the way to go. They knew some geographic feature where they would initiate their pop-up to roll in and drop their ordnance. The idea with SCAR is you had this RF-4 running around in enemy territory, would find a target of opportunity, shoot back out of enemy territory, rendezvous with shooter phantoms that are waiting for a target, and then lead that two or four ship back into strike. And since there was no known geographic pop point, the RF-4 was supposed to put out, either shoot a Willie Pete rocket or put out a photo flash cartridge, which we use for night photography, optical photography, we put out in daytime, a big white cloud of mag when the magnesium lit off in the cartridge. And that would be the pop point, so many miles from the target. Then the RF-4 would proceed to the target and try to bracket the target with Willie Pete so that at the apex of their pull-up, when the Phantoms rolled in with ordnance, all they had to do is drop their bombs between the two smoke spots on the ground. Well, in, in the Pacific, where I was flying, we didn't have Willie Peets, but we had photo flash. So when we would do this at Cope Thunders down at the Philippines, we'd lead the Phantoms in, the Strikers in, <clears throat> we'd pop one photo flash cartridge at the, strike, at the pop point, of course, they're about two miles in trail, mile, mile and a half in trail. And then we'd stroke it up an afterburner. And didn't look at your speed after that. You had to be going like 420 for the, the heavily laden F4s carrying bombs, you know, or else we didn't leave them. Like we just light the afterburner and turn toward the target. And the only thing we had to mark the target with were two more photo flash cartridges, one on each side. And we had dropped down to what looked like 100 feet. You, you stop looking at the radar altimeter at that point, and and you'd be doing about 600 knots in full grunt, and roll into 90 degrees of bank because the cartridges came out the left side, and using a trigger in the front seat, you pull the trigger, drop one, and then go over the target and drop the other one. Well, it was and that's why it was a suicide mission. If you ever had to do it in combat, no one's going to fly right over a target in a high threat environment like this. But we trained to it. And like I said, you, you never really knew exactly how high you were. You knew you were low. So there's one particular mission where this happened. And I just recall that I'm in 90 degrees of left bank. I pop out the photo flash cartridges. And my backseater, as we come off the target, said, you know, those things hit the ground before they went off. 
which meant we were way below 100 feet at the time that we bracketed the target. The good news was the strikers were very happy. They they got to their apex, rolled inverted, and saw the smoke and obliterated the target. But crazy times. Not a time I mean, to be I, your altimeter. <laughs> yeah, I just remember that we couldn't keep up with the arc. I was in the soft wing F4E uh, when I did this. I was thinking I was in the F-16, it was the F4E. And we just, the guy, the R4 is, was so slick, so fast, and we just couldn't keep up. Yeah, it's about the only defense we had was speed. Yeah. All right, Slick. So we've been doing all the talking, which isn't unusual because you got a, a bunch of combat pilots here. <laughs> and, you know, the, the best way to start a conversation with a pilot is, you know, tell us about yourself. But I know you have a lot more flying stories. So since we've since we've shared some of ours, why don't you tell us one? All right. Well, since there's been a lot of combat stories, and I think I told a combat story last year, and you guys kind of started it in our pre-brief quickly, but being a Thunderbird, you get asked a lot of questions by a lot of people. And one question that always finally comes up is people ask, well, how do you, how do you go to the bathroom in the jet, right? So I know you guys have all probably fielded this question before, and it's, you know, nothing fancy. It's just a plastic bag with some powder in it that when you pee in it, it turns into a gel and doesn't spill all over the cockpit. So and that was one of the biggest things about, you know, the Thunderbirds is you forget that you go, okay, cool. You guys are fighter pilots. You fly these cool airplanes all over the place, but they have to get to where they're going. So obviously we would have to fly a lot of cross country. So in 2009, we had the really unique opportunity to go do an Asia tour and you know, had to fly the jets all the way across, you know, from Vegas to, to Hickam and then from Hickam, you know, out to Australia was the big stretch. And so, of course, Air Force thinks of everything. They go, you know, we should bring like a spare pilot with us because we got eight jets. And what if one of you guys gets sick and we need to move the jets and all that kind of stuff? So they're like, hey, Slick, you just came from the F-16 weapons school. Do you know anybody that maybe could go TDY six weeks for us to be a backup cross-country pilot? I'm like, absolutely, I know who we should bring on this six-week Asia tour at the time, Major Andrew Dice Lyons, for anybody that knows Dice, he's the life of the party, the most funny guy in the squadron, and an incredible guy and a great instructor. So Dice signs up to go fly with the Thunderbirds and get to fly a red, white, and blue jet if any of us get sick. So we do a show at uh, Hawaii, and now we've got an 11-hour planned sortie with 18 in-air refuelings to get from Hickam, 18. Because, you know, Jekyll, going back to your your fuel state discussion, you know, 7,200 pounds was a full, full Viper in the configuration that we flew the air show in. So we were just constantly on the taker to make sure that we're, we're topped off. So... Sure enough, one of the guys, we don't know if he got sick or he decided that he didn't want to do this leg. So he goes, ah, knock it off. I, I got to I gotta fly on the C-17. Dice, you're in. He's like, sweet. And of course, you know, I'm just like talking up the Thunderbirds. I'm like, Dice, you're going to love flying with us. The jets are awesome. The crew chiefs are amazing. You don't have to do anything. You just show up to the jet. Your helmet will be in there. Your gloves are wherever you want them to be. The pubs, the even the piddle packs are right there in the map case. Life is great. So... Of course, you know, there's trauma. We're stepping to spares. People are moving around. And finally, Dice, we're like, sorry, dude, we're going to have to leave you here with a broken jet as number three steps to a jet. So calling out my buddy, Colonel Kirby Gat Enser, uh, who was number three at the time, he steps to a spare. Dice jumps in. It's like his second or third start. Finally gets going. I'm going to make the push. Boom. We take off. We leave Hickam to go to Australia, and it's going to be epic. And Dice is like fired up. He's flying a red, white, and blue jet. How cool is that? He's like, ah, oh, if I throw the dogfight switch outboard, the smoke comes on this is cool right all right well it's really cool it's really cool after you know the first sortie and you go okay kind of keep everybody going talking on the radio heather you've been on these long yeah you all have been on these long sorties right there's no aisle there's nobody bringing you snacks you just got to sit there and for 11 hour plan sortie you're in for a long haul so you've got all your food got all your drinks you got to stay hydrated right but don't worry you know you've been taken care of from the piddle pack scenario so Hey, hey, everybody, spread out. You, you need to be racehorse, which is the 3-1 code word for I have to use the bathroom. Now it's the time to do it. So we kind of, hey, I'm done. Okay, now I can do it. So we don't have like everybody looking down and hands off as they're doing their business. Well, first racehorse stop. No, no issues, no problems. And then, you know, the joke was in, on the Thunderbirds because the cockpit's so small, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have all this food and water and all this stuff around you because the cockpit's so small. So you'd kind of eat and drink your way to captivity and then pee your way to freedom. And then you'd pee your way back into captivity because yeah, on an 11-hour sortie, you had like, you know, 20 piddle packs surrounding you and stuffed all around the seat and everything. So 
it's about you know hour two into the into the the flight and dice comes on the radio and he's like he's like where are all those piddle packs she said the the crew chiefs would put in here i'm like well they're in the little pubs bag next to the map case and he's like yeah it's it's not in here and then a couple minutes later gat comes over the radio and he goes yeah dice when i stepped to the spare i grabbed your pubs bag with all the piddle packs i have like 40 piddle packs in my jet right now he's like well i only had the one that was in my g suit dude he's like you really took all the piddle packs out of the jet it's like yeah man i'm really sorry so of course for the first or the second hour into it now it's like funny to like rejoin close and like hold up all your empty piddle packs to dice but that poor dude you know he had one way to come up with a solution because the piddle packs come in an extra ziploc bag so he took his gloves off put them into the Ziploc bag, had one extra use of a, a, a makeshift piddle pack, and then had a nine-hour sortie in front of it with no piddle pack. So that's one of those stories that not told often, but I got to give a shout out to, to Dice for really sucking it up, taking one for the team, and really toughing it out. That was one of the toughest stories for anybody sitting through an 11-hour sortie to not have the ability to relieve themselves. So he, I don't know how he did it. Well, he's he like, did, you so. know I feel his pain because last year I told a story of flying from Tampa to Argentina thinking I had gotten the uh the how do you go to the bathroom in a in a in a viper sold no no I did not and so I also had to hold it for 12 hours from Tampa yeah. all the way to Argentina across the the Panama Canal I'll just say you guys are luckier because you're a pressure feed system being a gravity <laughs> feed system and a 30 degree <laughs> reclined seat way more challenging yeah, I, I, I hats off to you for, for being able to do it. And, and and of course, really, hopefully the audience got a chuckle out of that and, and the answered question of, of how, how they do the business going cross country. But yeah, I tell you, so, so to get with 40 uh, piddle packs and, and dice with one, um, you know, planning, oh, no. I guess. <laughs> I bet I bet he hit with some beers. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, everybody, I have to say thank you so much for being here, for, for telling stories and, and entertaining us. And, and really, I can't believe we've just completed two years of the Aerospace Advantage, and we're going into our third for 2023. So thank you all for, for being here, making it happen, sharing your time, sharing your stories, and happy holidays. And we look forward to working with everybody next year. Hey, great, Slick. Good job. Happy holidays, Slick. Hey, Slick. Hey, Slick. And everyone out there, happy holidays. Thanks. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.